Thank you, Madam Speaker. I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material on the subject of my special order. Without objection. Madam Speaker, we might be starting a new year, but so far the problems remain the same. This week marks the one-year anniversary of Joe Biden being sworn in as President of the United States and, of course, also the one-year anniversary of one party far-left Democrat rule in Washington. The past year was one of unprecedented crises as a direct result. The American people face an economic crisis, an energy crisis, a border crisis, an education crisis, a crime crisis, a COVID-19 crisis, and a national security crisis as a direct result of Joe Biden and congressional Democrats' failed leadership and their far-left socialist agenda. In this hour, a cross-section of my Republican colleagues will address and highlight these issues as we stand for the opposite policies, and we are very anxious to be returned to the majority so that we can solve these ongoing dilemmas. Madam Speaker, I am delighted to yield first to the gentleman from Texas, Dr. Babbitt. Thank you so very much, uh, the gentleman from Louisiana, my good friend right across the Sabine River from me and my district in Texas. No president has ever had a worse first year in office than Joe Biden. And sadly, his deteriorating 42% approval rating perfectly mirrors the de deteriorating state of our country. We are facing crises on nearly every front and our commander in chief, who by the way, is responsible for creating each and every one of these crises, is doing absolutely nothing to stop them. However, the most threatening of these concerns is still the unmitigated disaster that is raging at our southern border. More than 1.7 million illegal alien apprehensions happened under Biden's watch last year. And those are just the ones that we caught. Instead of securing our borders, this administration spent all of 2021 sweeping the rule of law under the rug and using the cover of darkness to fly thousands of unvetted and un-COVID tested illegal aliens across the country to be released into our neighborhoods. How many more innocent women and children need to be assaulted, raped, and trafficked? How many more Americans need to overdose on Chinese fentanyl that is being smuggled across the border? How many more terrorists need to be caught trying to infiltrate our nation? What level of threat do we need to reach to finally garner some action from this president? Americans are tired of paying for this administration's ignorance and political games. This is a new year, Mr. President. Use it wisely. It's past time that you live up to the oath that you swore. I yield back. Thank you, my friend. Uh, there are so many crises, it's hard for us to keep count. I uh, will yield next uh, to my dear friend from the state of Indiana, Ms. Walorski. Two minutes. I thank my friend for yielding. This week, our nation is making a solemn anniversary 49 years since the deadly Roe v. Wade decision. For nearly half a century, pro-life Americans have been standing strong to defend precious human life and the most vulnerable among us. Right now, we're facing some tough challenges. Under the current one-party rule in Washington, Americans are witnessing unprecedented attacks on pro-life protections across the country. Time and time again, I've come to this floor to oppose Democrats' radical anti-life agenda. As many times as it takes, I will stand here to reject the attacks on life and I'll vote no on taxpayer-funded services including the wicked proposal to permit abortion on demand at any time bankrolled by the American people. These are dark days in this country. At the same time, we have so much to be happy and hopeful for as we look at this new year. The Supreme Court, including my fe fellow Hoosier Justice Amy Coney Barrett, is currently considering the most significant challenge to Roe v. Wade since 1973. This could be the final anniversary that we stand here and proclaim under Roe v. Wade. For five decades, we've been in a long battle against abortion, and this is the time to restore the dignity of life and protect life once and for all. 
As a pro-life lawmaker, I'm proud to stand alongside millions of Americans in Indiana and across the country who believe in the inherent value of life. Our enduring commitment to life and the truth will prevail. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, dear friend, and you're exactly right. The sanctity of human life is one of the central principles that the country is founded upon, and it, it does get darkest before the dawn. There is hope on the horizon. Madam Speaker, I'm delighted to yield next. From Indiana, we'll go to New Jersey. Uh, the gentleman uh, from New Jersey, Mr. Van Drew. Mr. Vice Chair, thank you for yielding and thank you for your leadership. The President's most important job is to lead to lead and protect our country. Yet time and again, all we have seen from President Biden is a failure to lead. Biden's handling of Afghanistan led to the death of 13 American service members and left hundreds more abandoned. This was a failure to lead. Biden's handling of the border has been a disaster, with more than two million illegal immigrants being apprehended at our border. This was a failure to lead. Biden failed to shut down COVID-19 and has allowed more Americans to die from this disease despite widespread access to vaccines. This was a failure to lead. Inflation. Inflation is at a 40-year high. Supply chains are crippled and labor shortages have hindered an economic recovery. This has been a failure to lead. Soft on crime policy has resulted in 16 of America's largest cities to suffer from new highs in homicide rates and a 115% increase on attacks against our law enforcement officials. All while President Biden and House Democrats demand to defund our police. This has been a failure to lead. This is not the America I know. The America I know is strong and it deserves a strong leader, not the worst president in our history, not one that continues time and again to fail to lead. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Van Drew. And those are not just Republican talking points. Politico had a uh, story this morning. They asked Americans in a nationwide poll to give the president a, a, a letter grade, and 37% of Americans give him an F. 85% or more of Republicans, uh, but also, they say, an alarming number of Democrats give a D or an F grade. So you're exactly right. It is a failure. An F minus, says Mr. True. Madam Speaker, I am uh, delighted next to yield to my good friend from the state of Tennessee, Mr. Burchett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's the great state of Tennessee. Uh, for the last year, Joe Biden and the Democrats have completely controlled our government in Washington, Madam Speaker. Their first order of business when they took power was to ran through Congress almost $2 trillion in federal spending under the so-called American Rescue Plan. When this bill became law last March, Democrats said it was necessary to fight the coronavirus. Ten months later, our country is still dealing with the same problems Democrats claimed their bills would solve. COVID tests are sold out at drugstores and testing centers have hour-long lines. Not even Kamala Harris can, can give a straight answer about when Americans will see the at-home test kits. Is it this week? Is it next week? Is it sometime in the future? I don't think she knows. We have overwhelmed hospitals that are struggling to treat patients due to staffing shortages. Corrupt teachers unions are forcing students out of the classroom and bullying parents. Businesses of all sizes and across industries cannot find enough workers to keep up with the demand. The American Rescue Plan failed miserably to address, our, uh, our, to address or prevent these issues, Madam Speaker. That's because it mostly focused on funding liberal special interests instead of targeted pandemic relief. This whole debacle confirmed two things. Congress cannot, they, they cannot spend its way out of a problem, and Democrats will always use a crisis to advance their political agenda. Joe Biden promised to shut down the coronavirus when he took office. One year later, all he shut down are America's hospitals and businesses. Thank you, Vice Chairman Johnson, for your adequate and more than lackluster leadership skills, and I yield the remainder of my time. <laughs> Thank you, my friend, for keeping me humble. I am uh, uh, delighted next, uh, Madam Speaker, to yield to uh, another great gentleman from the state of Texas, the great state of Texas, um, Mr. Fluger. And we've just come uh, straight to the floor from a members and media roundtable on the border and crime crises, and he led that so ably. Delighted to hear what he has to say in his two minutes. I yield. Uh, thank you uh, to Mr. Johnson. Madam Speaker, uh, it's hard to pick the crisis to talk about because there's so many. Um, you know, I'd like to talk about unity. I was at the inauguration last year. I heard the president's speech. 
I heard him campaign. His message was centered on restoring unity to an angry nation. He promised to bring us together. Well, he has brought the American people together, that is for sure, because everyone now understands the full magnitude of the crises that we're going through. He has united the country in that fact alone. And one year ago, I want everyone to remember, we were not experiencing the inflation that we are, the highest rate in 40 years. We did not have foreign adversaries who were treading over our policies and looking at us as weak. Right now, we have a border that is in complete chaos and complete crisis. And it's only been one year under President Biden's reign, and our nation is directionless from the masthead in the midst of chaos, not to mention that our international reputation and our influence has been squandered through policy failure after policy failure. When you look at this poster right here and you look at the energy crisis that we're dealing with, the Ukraine right now is in the midst of not knowing whether or not they're going to be invaded by the Russians. What a terrible position to be in. The president has green-lighted Nord Stream. He failed to sanction the Nord Stream pipeline. The energy crisis that's going on in Eastern Europe right now, the fact that we are not strong around the world in our messaging to deter our enemies and to help our allies is directly leading to this issue that we see in the Ukraine right now. And you know who's watching? China. China is watching this and they're wondering whether or not Taiwan is gonna be next. We have got to get back to a strong, firm understanding of law and order, the same discussion that we just had on the border crisis. And we have got to reassert our leadership to make sure that our country, the greatest nation that this world has ever known, will choose to follow law and order. And with that, I yield back. I thank you, my friend, for that uh, keen insight that you gained, faithfully serving our country in the military. Thank you for that service. And Madam Speaker, delighted to yield to another gentleman who has served us so well on the front lines of law enforcement before he got to Congress, Mr. Stauber, Minnesota. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Madam Speaker, I could speak for hours about this, as, this administration's multiple failures over the last year, but I only have a couple minutes, so I'll just cover inflation, one of them. Since Joe Biden took office, inflation has risen every single month. Americans are paying more for just about everything while earning less in every paycheck. This is not sustainable, and it didn't have to be this way. This administration is so out of touch with the average American that despite inflation reaching a 40-year high, they are still pushing for more reckless spending that will only make this crisis worse. American families are paying substantially more for everyday products, from gasoline to groceries to energy for heating their homes this winter. To heat their homes in northern Minnesota when it's 30 below for a week straight. Make no mistake, Inflation is a tax on us all, especially our working class and those on fixed incomes. It is no secret that we live in a very polarized nation right now. But there is one thing a strong majority of Americans agree on. Joe Biden's first year in office has been disastrous to the American people. We deserve better. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you, my friend. Uh, Madam Speaker, delighted to yield next to the gentleman from Utah, uh, Mr. Owens. Thank you, my good friend from Louisiana, for your great leadership. Over the past year, I've spent time throughout Utah's 4th District. I've heard from Utahns from all walks of life, and month after month, they shared the same concerns. Soaring inflation, skyrocketing prices, and decreasing wages. That's no surprise, because gas is up. 49.6%. Used cars are up 37.3%. Gas utilities are up 24.1%. Meat, fish, and eggs are up 12.5%. Electricity is up 6.3%. And on top of this, as real wages have decreased eight out of the last 11 months, our economy is still missing millions of pre-pandemic jobs and employers are continue to struggle with persistent labor shortages. And what is this administration doing to help? You can't make this up. 
dismissing inflation as high class problems and transitory, adding a national debt with money we don't have on programs we don't need. And just last week, advocating a nuke to nuke the filibuster the president defended for decades to push through a radical federal takeover of our elections. Our economy still sh should be thriving right now, but inaction on purpose by this administration has massively increased our national debt, which still sits at $29 trillion, by the way, stifled growth, and financially crippled American families and small businesses. We're closing out the first year of Biden's presidency with the worst inflation in 40 years, open borders, emboldened adversaries, a botched withdrawal, withdrawal from Afghanistan, and a repeated push to increase the size, scope, and reach of federal government. This year, I encourage President Biden to start paying attention to real needs of real Americans. Maybe then we can start seeing real results. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, my friend. It's so well said, as always. And I think one of the key words you said there was purposeful. These, are, these crises are not happenstance. These are direct results of policy choices. Madam Speaker, I yield now to uh, my good friend and gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Grothman. So many areas to pick from in which we talk about the first year of this administration. No country can exist if you don't have immigration laws. And I can't think of anywhere where the new, new administration is more of a change from the old. We've gone to a situation which about 25,000 people every year crossed our southern border to now routinely over 75,000, tripling the number of people who come across the border. And that's received a lot of attention, but not enough attention is received to the lack of people being pushed back across the border if they're caught here breaking crimes or otherwise. In the, in the first six months of 2020, about 93,000 people were kicked out. This time around, it's about 18,000. So we have about another 70,000 people who we don't want in this country, primarily because they've broken the law, but under the Biden administration, we don't kick them out. And we have to also look at the carrot that they're giving people to come here. In the Build Back Better bill, trying to give free college education to people who come here illegally, and every Democrat but one in this body voted for it, saying, yes, absolutely. We not only want people to come here illegally, we'll give them a free college education. Free medical care, unbelievable. And showing that the number one priority is to get people here illegally, they are not even given tests for COVID, which says something or other. I mean, on the one hand, it's important everybody even get a shot if they're hanging around Washington, D.C., but if you're coming across the southern border, we don't care. Um, unbelievable, quite a change in America compared to what it used to be, and it's gonna take a lot of work when we get a new president to undo the huge amount of damage that's been done to the fabric of this country in the first 12 months of Joe Biden. Thank you, my friend. It's so well said. It's as if they're incentivizing lawlessness. That's exactly what we're seeing, and everybody knows it. The gentleman from California is next. Madam Speaker, uh, happy to yield two minutes to my good friend, Ms. Lamoff. Thank you to my colleague, Mr. Johnson. Appreciate this special order time. Uh, you know, of course, this week does mark the first year of the Biden administration. Unfortunately, it was one of unprecedented crisis. Indeed, it's a target-rich environment for us to talk about here tonight. The Democrats have controlled the executive branch, both chambers of Congress, and allowing them to pass so far $2 trillion out of their $9 trillion plans. This action has also caused the highest inflation in decades, hitting middle and lower income class hardest in this country. This year, under Democrat leadership, Americans are paying more for just about everything from housing, clothes, food, and gas, especially in energy. On the way to the airport in California, it was $5 plus, $5.39 at one place. Incredible. In the dead of winter, people are seeing the cost of heating their homes skyrocket. When you, I see when you stop all sorts of development of energy in this country, you're not gonna have the supply, and that sends a signal to the whole market to raise prices, including the Biden administration telling OPEC overseas, go ahead and send us more while cutting off our own pipelines and further development on federal lands. This, this of course, ripples through everything else in costs. In my real life as a farmer, we're gonna see our costs of energy, through whether it's diesel fuel, gasoline, and in fertilizer, 
skyrocket. That's either going to have to be passed along to the consumer at the store or farmers go broke in this country. Small business owners face the same thing. Everything's going up more in cost, vaccine mandates, less employees. I mean, I wish we could paint a brighter picture and not have it appear to be a partisan one. It really isn't partisan. It's about having success as a country. Unfortunately, the Biden administration doesn't seem to ha have a clue what that success would look like. Indeed, they're chasing their own mandates, putting us in a terrible position as a people and the economy going forward. They need to change their thinking or the voters need to change them out. I yield back. Thank you. My friend, it's not partisanship. We are sharing the facts. You're exactly right. I would encourage my colleagues, there's so many who want to speak, and we are, uh, it is a target-rich environment with so many crises. We're going to try to stick to two minutes on these yields. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'm delighted to yield the gentlelady, my dear friend from Missouri, Ms. Hart. Sir. Thank you. Tomorrow will mark one year since President Biden's inauguration, and Americans are left asking, are we better off under this administration? Judging by his all-time low approval ratings, the answer from Americans is a resounding no. Everywhere you look, there's a crisis riddled with incompetence, division, and dysfunction. At our southern border, Biden has allowed nearly two million illegal immigrants to enter our nation, creating the worst border crisis in 30 years. In the classroom, Biden has targeted parents and their role in education. His administration even lobbied for them to be called domestic terrorists. In our communities, violent crime is at all-time highs. Last year, the murder rate was higher than at any point since 1996. On the economy, Biden's mishandling of our federal government has created the highest inflation rate in 40 years. Bare shelves, high gas prices, and supply chain issues continue to dog this administration. And on the world stage, Biden botched our withdrawal from Afghanistan, surrendering to the Taliban and making America a laughing stock to our adversaries. All of this resulted in the deaths of 13 service members, including one from my home state of Missouri. Instead of addressing these issues, President Biden has doubled down on his far-left socialist policies, out-of-control spending, and incompetence. It's past time for a change. America deserves better. It needs leadership that listens and fights for hardworking families, not against them. I'm proud to help lead the fight alongside my fellow Republicans to reverse course by unleashing our economy, securing our border, respecting parents, defending life and our foundational values, and providing for the common defense. On this one-year anniversary commemorating the misery of the Biden administration, we commit ourselves to never stop fighting for what is right, to work harder than ever, to never give up. America is depending on us. Thank you, my friend. So well said. Madam Speaker, I yield next. The gentleman hails from the state of the new national championship football team, the state of Georgia, Mr. Clyde. <laughs> Thank you, Vice Chairman Johnson. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, to tomorrow marks the one-year anniversary of President Biden's inauguration, meaning Americans have now endured 365 days of an absent administration, 52 weeks of policy failures, 12 months of utter turmoil, and one year of constant crippling crises. Earlier today, a Rasmussen poll revealed 60% of the country considers the president's first year in office unsuccessful, and 50% said it was very unsuccessful, with a third of the Democrats believing Biden's first year was a failure. All of this has contributed to his abysmal 33% rating, the lowest since Jimmy Carter. In all sincerity, I didn't imagine this much damage could be done in just one year, but here we are facing an economic crisis with hyperinflation supply chain crisis, a labor shortage crisis, a border crisis, a national security crisis, an energy crisis with incredible gas prices, an education crisis, a COVID crisis, a crime crisis, and an election integrity crisis with Democrats trying to push through election reforms that would federalize our election and eliminate voter ID. Ultimately, these all stem from a leadership crisis in the White House, a leadership crisis that has caused Americans unnecessary hardship. As we enter the second year of the Biden administration's rule, the president has an important decision to make. Will he continue to sidestep from the crises he's created, destined to inflict more destruction, or will he confront these crises head on and implement so successful solutions? Mr. President, the American people demand successful solutions, and they deserve successful solutions. Thank you. They do deserve it, my friend. And Madam Speaker, I'm delighted to yield the next two minutes to 
Gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Rose. Thank you, Vice Chairman Johnson. President uh, Biden ran his campaign on a message of unity, but since day one of his administration, he has been defined by the divisive policies that are the wrong approach for Tennessee families and workers. In 2021, we saw cartels take control of our southern border. We saw the worst inflation in decades. We saw Afghanistan fall into the hands of terrorists as we hastily and incompetently withdrew our forces from the country, leaving billions of dollars of modern military equipment and hundreds of Americans and Afghan allies behind. And finally, we saw abusive government overreach in the form of vaccine mandates taken to new heights. With President Biden in the White House and Democrats in control of Congress, Americans know 2022 will be no better. According to a recent Momentum poll, more than half of Americans are more fearful than hopeful about what 2022 has in store for them, and with good reason. Just take a glimpse at the state of our economy. The Consumer Price Index rose 7% in December, the highest rate seen since 1982. This comes on the heels of President Biden's reckless spending agenda and senseless policies that have created a labor shortage, led to a decline in real personal income, raised costs of consumer goods, gas, and home heating costs, contributed to the supply chain disruptions that are causing drastic shortages and bare shelves across America. This is President Joe Biden's version of America, and it's costing Tennesseans more each day. President Biden can try to talk around it and often refuses to talk about it at all, but the reality remains the same. His administra administration's policies have been devastating to this nation. More than ever, Americans want America first leadership. As we begin the first days of 2022, I remain steadfast in my commitment to focus on the needs of the good folks of Tennessee who I represent, not the whims of the permanent class of political elites in Washington, D.C. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, my friend. Tennessee is well represented, and uh, Madam Speaker, I yield the next two minutes to the gentleman from Wisconsin, another seasoned, very effective legislator, Mr. Fitzgerald. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Madam Speaker, this has been a year of crisis under the leadership of President Joe Biden. At the southern border, our country was notice, noticeably lacking leadership and solutions from the White House. Instead, President Biden took regressive actions. He halted construction on the border wall, brought back catch and release, and got rid of the remain in Mexico policy. Because of these decisions, over 1.7 million illegal immigrants have been encountered at the southern border since President Biden took office. The number of illegal crossings at the border has risen at a rate faster under President Biden that, than at any other time in recent history. And U.S. Custom and Border Protection reported that fentanyl seizures increased 134 percent in fiscal year 2021. I saw this crisis firsthand when I visited the southern border with my colleagues, and I've led and supported legislative solutions in Congress to combat this crisis. But it's disheartening and unacceptable that President Biden has neither visited the border to witness the crisis, nor has he proposed solutions to control the unmanageable levels of border crossings and fentanyl trafficking. To say President Biden has underdelivered to the American people is beyond an understatement. I say it again, this year has been a year of crisis under the leadership of President Biden. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, my friend. What he has delivered is crises upon crises. That's exactly right. Uh, Madam Speaker, yield the next two minutes to the gentleman from Florida we affectionately refer to as the Chief, Mr. Jimenez. Thank you, Madam, Madam Speaker. Uh, you know, life has been hard uh, for American people as President Biden concludes his first year in office. Unfortunately, too many in this chamber have bowed down to the most radical fringes of the Democrat Party. Sad reality today is liberals in Congress have uh, no clue what everyday hardworking Americans are going through. They care more about pushing their radical agenda than helping working families. The result? More inflation, higher gas prices, unconstitutional vaccine mandates, broken supply chains, and Americans struggling to make ends meet. 
On our side of the aisle, Republicans are committed to making sure we get the American people back to work, ensuring that small businesses can find employees to help keep their businesses open, making sure Americans have uninterrupted access to goods, and getting our country roaring back with a strong economy and safe communities. Those are the issues that Americans really care about. Here in Washington, Republicans will use our congressional authority to hold the Biden administration accountable for the Afghanistan de debacle, where we don't know how many Americans are still left behind in, in Afghanistan, for choosing to wreck our energy sector, uh, where at once we were energy independent a year ago, now we're begging OPEC to please produce more, while handing Putin the Nord Stream 2 pipeline for allowing the southern borders to be kept wide open, and much, much more. After only a year of the Biden administration and his radical governing our country, we've had enough. The American people have had enough, and our people, our country, deserve better. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, my friend. So well said. And Madam Speaker, we cover in the Republican caucus literally uh, coast to coast. We'll go from Florida out to California. Yield two minutes to the gentleman from California, Mr. Obanoff. Madam Speaker, several days ago, the Department of Labor released statistics on job creation and inflation in the United States, and this data should be deeply alarming to every American. This Congress over the last year has dumped trillions of dollars of excess federal spending into our economy. And at the time, economists warned us that doing so was dangerously inflationary. And unfortunately, those fears have come to fruition. The statistics for the month of December show inflation at nearly 7% on an annualized basis. Madam Speaker, that is the highest rate of inflation in nearly 40 years. When inflation is caused through government action, as this round of inflation clearly is, it represents an unseen tax that's paid by every American because it raises the prices of everything that we buy. Equally alarming is the fact that real wage growth has not kept up with inflation. In fact, the Department of Labor says that for all of last year, real wage growth was negative nearly 2.5%. Madam Speaker, if we don't correct this trend, it's going to result in an entire generation of Americans being driven towards poverty because their wages are not keeping up with the prices that they pay for the goods that they need to survive. Madam Speaker, we need to get our fiscal house in order and correct this runaway federal spending before our children suffer the consequences. I yield back. So well said. Elections do have consequences, and they go to the next generation for sure. Uh, California is so well represented in our conference. I'd like to stay there and yield two minutes to the gentlelady from there, Ms. Steele. Thank you, Vice Chair Johnson. Madam Speaker, this administration's failed policies have led to record inflation and empty store shelves across the country. Inflation just reached the highest level in 40 years. And at the same time, basic goods are harder and harder to find at the stores thanks to supply chain mess. Every day we see a new story about things getting more expensive, life getting harder for Americans. Hardworking families are sick and tired of paying more and getting less. I've introduced three bills that would help fix the supply chain crisis and ensure goods make it to the stores and consumers. These issues are urgent, but there has been no movement on these bills. Meanwhile, Democrats in Washington continue to spend more as your paychecks get smaller and costs continue to rise. I will continue to fight against these bad policies and push for solutions. And I yield back to Vice Chair Johnson. Thank you so much for your strong work on behalf of consumers and, and small business owners. Uh, you do so well. Madam Speaker, we went from Florida to California and now to Pennsylvania. Yield two minutes to the gentleman from there, Mr. Kelly. Thank you. I, I uh, thank the gentleman from Louisiana. Madam Speaker, as America marks one year since President Biden's inauguration, Republicans are focused on delivering solutions to the multitude of crises his administration has created. After one year of one-party rule, the reality is America families are seeing empty shelves at the grocery store, businesses cannot find workers, and inflation just hit the highest rate in 40 years. Meanwhile, the catastrophe at our southern border continues to worsen. In the past 12 months, more than 1.7 million people have been caught trying to enter the United States illegally. The Biden administration can ignore these inconvenient truths 
all they want. But you know who's noticing? The American people are noticing. These are the same people who are working every day, the people driving our economy forward in spite of President Biden stacking the odds against them. Be assured, when Republicans regain the majority in the House, we will continue tackling these challenges by getting government out of the way, restoring our God-given freedoms, and ensuring Americans keep more of their hard-earned money. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, my friend. So well said. Madam Speaker, I yield two minutes now to the gentlelady from Arizona, one of the true border states that sees all these crises firsthand. Ms. Leslie. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker and Mr. Johnson. Well, it's been one year since President Biden and the Democrats have had complete control of running our country. They have the House, the Senate, and the presidency. And what have they accomplished in this one year? Well, inflation has gone through the roof, 40-year high, gas prices are up, grocery prices are up, the utility costs have gone up, and the border is wide open with sex trafficking, human trafficking, fentanyl flooding across our border, and COVID deaths are higher than they have ever been before. And you know those long lines that you see of Americans waiting in line for COVID tests? Well, guess what? The Biden administration diverted over $2 billion that was meant for those testing of COVID and for medical supplies and diverted it to house illegal immigrants. Don't be surprised or mistaken, but it's the Democrat policies that have caused these problems. And what are the Democrats doing now while the country is going down the tubes? Well, they're pushing election laws. Election laws where they want to rig elections to their favor and fund their own elections. This is insanity. And I hope my Democratic colleagues will work together with us to solve the problems that are facing Americans today. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, my friend. So well said, uh, Madam Speaker. I now yield uh, two minutes. The gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Mann. Well, I, I want to thank the gentleman uh, from Louisiana for hosting this today. A lot of things to talk about. We're a year and we could talk about immigration. We could talk about inflation. We can talk about crime. We can talk about Afghanistan. The list goes on and on. But I want to talk for a little bit uh, today about trade and specifically our relationship with China. I rise today to call the Biden administration to action regarding our trade partnership or lack thereof with China. China has proven to be a bad faith negotiator and they are using the United States as a doormat. Our country made a deal with China two years ago on January 15th, 2020, and China has failed to live up to their end of the bargain by a long shot. As part of this deal, China committed to importing $36 billion of U.S. ag products in 2020 and 2021 combined, but they have fallen short by nearly $7 billion. China sold American farmers a bill of goods and the Biden administration has made no efforts to rectify this egregious situation. Now the phase one is expiring, farmers and ranchers are frustrated to say the least. USA Secretary Tom Vilsack, in a feeble effort to reassure us, said that Ambassador Tai, our U.S. Trade Representative, continues to converse with China about the necessity of living up totally and completely to the Phase One trade agreement, making up their deficit over the next course of the, se of the next several years. This is completely unacceptable. The next several years was never part of this deal, which is not a complex one. China said they would purchase a certain amount of agriculture goods and they've fallen short by a margin that suggests that they never intended to live up to their end of this deal in the first place. Again, we have not seen any effort from this administration on behalf of farmers, which is why I'm standing here today to state the obvious. The United States must either force China to comply with their end of the agreement or punish them for failing to do so. That's how deals work. At the very least, we need this administration developing a new, comprehensive, realistic deal to collect the deficit. The time for conversations already took place long before the deal was signed January 15, 2020, when China signed that deal. This administration, a year in, needs to step up and defend our farmers and ranchers and our country from being financially manipulated by China. Yet another unnecessary crisis. Thank you, and I yield back.
Thank you for that plain talk from Kansas. And uh, Madam Speaker, I uh, yield now the gentleman from Arkansas, one of the brightest and most respected members of Congress, uh, Mr. Hill. Well, I thank the Vice Chairman of the conference. Uh, Madam Speaker, if the Biden administration were a new TV show streaming on Netflix or HBO, it clearly would have been canceled after the end of the first season. <laughs> on this anniversary of Mr. Biden's failed first year, I call attention to the crisis at the Southwest border, a crisis which President Biden and the Democrats have continuously chosen to turn a blind eye. In just one year, over 1.7 million illegal immigrants have been apprehended at the border, an all-time high. President Trump spent four years fighting to secure our border by enacting policies to keep Americans, especially in our communities along the border, safe. After less than a month in office, President Biden revoked the Trump-era border policies and replaced them, Madam Speaker, with what? Absolutely nothing. In April, three months after Joe Biden took office and two months after these policies were rescinded, I made my seventh trip to the southwest border. During that visit, I witnessed the most unstable conditions that I've seen since coming to Congress. I immediately called on President Biden then to reinstate the Trump-era policies that were working along our border. Finally, just a few weeks ago in December, it was announced that President Biden planned to re-implement President Trump's remain in Mexico policy. But Madam Speaker, we need action, not talk. President Biden should visit the border, talk to the communities there. President Biden should fire his Homeland Security Secretary who's not getting the job done. So in this first failed year, President Biden has neglected our Southwest border. That neglect is evident with deteriorating conditions, apprehensions at an all-time high, and record amounts of illegal drugs pouring across our open border, poisoning our families. Americans deserve better. Americans deserve a secure border. Americans deserve leadership. I thank my friend and I yield back. Thank you so much. Uh, Americans do deserve so much better. Uh, Madam Speaker, I yield now to gentle lady from California, Miss Kim. I hope your arm's all right. There. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Mr. Johnson, for yielding. One year ago, I joined several of my colleagues, especially the freshman Republican colleagues, in a letter to President Biden, showing our willingness to work with him on behalf of the American people to bridge the partisan gridlock because our president's success is our nation's success. While I'm proud that one year later that I've been able to get 12 bipartisan bills out of the House and four signed into law, I'm disappointed that the policies from the Biden administration encourage more division, more federal spending, and more crisis hurting American workers, families, and small businesses as we continue through the COVID-19 pandemic. Inflation is at a 40-year high, driving up prices everywhere from the grocery store to prices at the gas pump. We have record high numbers of migrants and illicit drugs at our southern border. St uh, straining our resources and empowering drug cartels. Our disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan resulted in the deaths of 13 U.S. service members, and we still have left the lives of Americans and our allies and military arsenal in the hands of the Taliban. In the latest edition of Partisan Politics, last week, one of my bipartisan bills was taken over and instead became over 700 pages of nationalizing elections and letting public funds be used for political campaigns. I will keep working through this gridlock, sticking to my conservative policies, principles, and fighting back against big government, big spending policies. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you for that principled leadership. You have been so effective, and we're, we're grateful you're here. Madam Speaker, I yield two minutes now from California to the refreshing state of Texas, Mr. Weber. I thank the gentleman. Madam Speaker, tomorrow, January the 20th, 2022, dare I say, a day that will live in infamy, <laughs> marks one year since Joe Biden was sworn in as president. I remember saying, this is the most important election of our lifetime. Unfortunately, I was right. One year under one party rule 
and in just one year, one huge continuing debacle and crisis. We went from energy independence to energy crisis, Madam Speaker, from a rebounding economy to the highest inflation in 40 years, from international peace through strength to increased tensions with our greatest adversaries, and might I add, losing the confidence of our allies. We went, Madam Speaker, from border security to two million illegal alien crossings, from the end of the pandemic to the never-ending pandemic, particularly with unconstitutional mandates. The cause, one Democrat disaster after another, and Americans are losing faith, not only with, the, with and in the performance of the current administration, but also with our governmental agencies, the FBI, the DOJ, the CDC, you name it, the list is endless. Democrats are showing who they are. Socialist, police defund defunders, open border advocates, anti-parents who just want to say in their child's schooling, is that too much to ask? That's what Democrats are. This is their brand. And that Democrat brand, I might add, is a disaster. We Republicans need to point it out every day in every way. And so to my Republican colleagues, I say, let's go Brandom. Brandom, I like it. Madam Speaker, I yield now the gentlelady from Illinois, another very effective legislator, Ms. Miller. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Congressman, for hosting this special order. Americans have experienced whiplash this past year as the Biden administration has spun us from the America First agenda to America Last. We watched in horror as the Taliban released thousands of Al Qaeda, ISIS, and Taliban prisoners from the prison at Bagram Air Base. Our service members had bravely sacrificed to capture those terrorists, and the Biden administration allowed them to be released. One of the ISIS-K prisoners led the bombing that killed 13 service members. Biden's failure in Afghanistan led to the surrender of tens of billions of dollars in U.S. military equipment to the Taliban. Military equipment paid for by U.S. taxpayers will now be used against America because of President Biden. As Afghanistan fell, President Biden disappeared, first to Camp David and then to Delaware. His cabinet refused to brief the American people directly and instead sent spokesmen. Additionally, the defense secretary refused to testify before Congress. The Biden administration then flew an estimated 78,000 Afghan nationals to American soil and then lied to the American people about the vetting process they were using to ensure that no ISIS, Al-Qaeda, or Taliban terrorists were brought to our shores. To this day, no one in the Biden administration has been held responsible for the disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan or for the lies that were told to the American people, and no one has been fired or resigned. Madam Speaker, who will be fired and who is resigning? The American people deserve accountability. China, our enemy, has watched all of this unfold, and sadly, our children and grandchildren will pay the price of Biden's incompetence. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, my friend. Well said. Madam Speaker, I'm delighted to yield two minutes next to the gentleman from the great state of Georgia, home of the new national championship football team. At least he didn't wear a red jacket. Two minutes to Mr. Carter. I thank the gentleman for yielding and for hosting this. Madam Speaker, Joe Biden's first year in office has exceeded all expectations. In 365 short days, Joe Biden has managed to inflict an entire term of pain and hardship on the American people. Grocery store shelves are empty. Prices are up 7% nationwide. Gas costs a dollar more per gallon today than it did when Biden took office. Americans lost the equivalent of two paychecks last year, and Biden has failed to add one single job from our 2019 I. In fact, Madam Speaker, only one thing has gone down in price during this administration, 
And that's the price of fentanyl. That's the price of fentanyl. Because of the fentanyl that's coming across the southern border. Washington Democrats were counting on Joe Biden to socialize our economy, and boy, did he deliver. His administration caved to teachers' unions, putting the wants of liberal elites ahead of the needs of our children who are desperate for high-quality in-person learning. Domestic terrorists, that is how his administration labeled parents who want better for their children than virtual learning. It's despicable. He caved to Russia, gutting the Keystone XL pipeline on his first day in office, but allowing the Nord Stream 2 pipeline to push ahead virtually unchecked. He caved to Fauci, who kept his job despite lying to Congress about gain-of-function research. You know, who isn't caving? Senator Manchin, the Supreme Court, and Republicans across the nation who are fed up with this administration's singular focus on stripping rights and opportunities away from Americans. This administration has more than earned its 33% approval rating, and I hope for the sake of our country that the next three years are nothing like this one we have endured. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I yield back. Thank you, my friend. Madam Speaker, happy to yield now two minutes to the gentlelady from Indiana, one of the smartest and hardest working, hardest working members of Congress, Ms. Sparks. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, my fellow colleague. Uh, I know that you know, we have talked a lot about different crises, and we do have a lot of crises. We have economic crisis, we have inflation crisis, we have energy cost crisis, we have supply chain crisis, we have education crisis, we have crime crisis, we have COVID response crisis, we have healthcare crisis, we have foreign relations and security crisis, we have freedom of speech crisis, we have centralized government and infringement on our rights crisis. But I think there is one crisis that is very disturbing and concerning to me as a naturalized American who immigrated to this great country. I went to the border three times, and what I saw, it's lawlessness, it's issue of national security, it's anarchy, and it is a crisis that is poses a risk to our sovereignty as a nation. And we can see what's happening in the country. Drug control, c cartels are controlling the border. They control drug trafficking and making billions on that. We have the highest deaths from overdoses in our country that ever existed. Our kids are dying and they're making a lot of money. The border is open. No one can control it. It poses risk to our national security. I hope we as all, as Americans who care about our country and our president, at least start dealing with one of the crises because it's a serious issue and we cannot disregard national security of this greatest country that ever existed on earth and put our people at risk. It's our responsibilities as representatives for this republic to stand up, regardless of party affiliations, and raise some issues, and we owe this duty to the American people. Thank you, and I, I yield back. Thank you so much. Madam Speaker, what my colleagues have illustrated here in this one-hour special order is the crisis that we have in this country. We are on the anniversary now of one year of far-left Democrat rule in Washington. We have unified government. The far-left Democrats are in charge of the White House, both houses of Congress. Elections have consequences. The American people can see it for themselves. Every poll across this country shows it. They know that it's crisis upon crisis upon crisis. You've heard my colleagues illustrate so many of those here this afternoon. If we had hours upon hours, we could continue all night. The economic crisis last year, inflation cost the average worker nearly two paychecks. An energy crisis, the national average for a gallon of gas rose 49.6% for the year. A border crisis, because the Democrats open border policies, every state is now a border state. An education crisis, President Biden promised to reopen schools in his first 100 days, but his administration secretly worked with teachers unions to keep the schools closed and label parents as domestic terrorists. 
a crime crisis. Over a dozen U.S. cities had a record high homicide rate in 2021. A COVID crisis. Although President Biden promised to shut down the virus, many Americans continue to struggle to find tests. And of course, many schools remain closed because of this. A national security crisis. Because of President Biden's weakness on the world stage, our adversaries in Beijing, Tehran, and Moscow are stronger today, and they are empowered. We could go on and on and on. I'm out of time, Madam Speaker, but I will just point out again, the latest poll that was released just this morning didn't look at just numbers. They asked the American people to give a letter grade to the president. 37% of Americans give the president an F, a failing grade, and more Americans give him an F than give him an A or a B. This is a failed presidency. These are failed policies. We are living under the crises that they have created. It's time for this to come to an end. We're grateful to the American people for recognizing this, and we look forward to bringing our solutions to bear after the election cycle this fall. Madam Speaker, with that, our special order hour is concluded, and I yield back.